Okay, very good morning, Thursday 30th of April. Hope you're doing well. Um, just having a quick look then of, of what I'm going to talk about. A bit of an update that you can see here about Jerome Powell, what happened with the Fed yesterday. We've got a couple of earnings reports to be aware of, Microsoft and Facebook in particular, that has caused a little bit of reaction in late hours in US trade and overnight. Uh, we've got some earnings reports to look out for. Of course, Amazon and Apple now reporting a bit later on this evening. We've also got then uh, data throughout the day and an ECB interest rate announcement to follow up from the Fed yesterday. So plenty for us to talk about and just having a quick look at the charts of the general sentiment for the market open and relatively steady in the currency market. Um, you would expect this to be the case with the ECB looming on the horizon only a couple of hours away and, and typically even though as I'll discuss potentially no real concrete action in a similar vein to the Fed, more a bit of a pledge and promise to do whatever it takes and therefore queuing up potentially more things to come at the preceding meeting, meetings in June, perhaps. So both the currency pairs, I mean, Euro is trading flat at the moment uh, and pretty similar for cable at the moment, uh, just sitting above its pivot level. Uh, equity markets, index futures positive. The DAX up about 122 and it follows the NASDAQ futures. It's off its best levels, but still up 61. Um, maybe perhaps the, I had an S&P um, chart marked up anyway from some previous discussions that we've had. And, you know, what a mighty rally that we've had in US equities, you know, since that bottoming out of the oil concerns when price went negative at the beginning of the prior week. We've now rallied the best part of almost 10% in the S&P 500. Um, so a combination of different things, obviously yesterday, um, and I'll, I'll run you through that some of that Gilead news in a bit more detail. We had a technical breach of the uh, resistance points of what we were seeing um, from the prior day session on Tuesday, and that came amid around when the Gilead news was hitting market. And then after market, well, we've had, first of all, the Fed, uh, and I'll explain a little bit more about that in a second, but a little bit of an initial dip on, I guess, if anything, a bit of a lack of clarity, maybe perhaps some people looking for a little bit more commitment, but I don't think he was ever going to do that at this point in time, given the lack of visibility going forward about how the virus is going to perform, so subsequently the policy actions that are going to be needed. So we had a little bit of a move down on the first part of the event with the Fed, and then we moved kind of back higher throughout the rest of the session. Then obviously Microsoft, Facebook came out, and that helped bump things up um, late yesterday, but also a kind of rebound in the overnight Asia-Pacific session. We had some Chinese uh, PMI data as well that generally was okay, domestically at least. Um, and just a slight fade of that. Uh, as Europe come in, but still positive overall. So yeah, that's the equity story uh, in fixed income, not too much going on, um, marginally higher up about three and a half in the 10 year, the Bund up 14 this morning ahead of the ECB. Uh, gold a little bit higher, uh, up about $20. Uh, it sounds like a large amount, but um, tricky one to trade really from a fundamental perspective because gold has become a little bit disconnected in that, in that typical uh, kind of flight to quality sense because as you're seeing again this morning we've had I think technically you can see here I'm just looking on a 30 minute candlestick you've had a retest of what was the high point that we saw just very late going into yesterday's session uh, and we had a test of that very early in the European morning and we're just managing to trade above there now uh, so if anything perhaps a little bit more technical with the move uh, given it's a little bit counterintuitive to the general uh, risk appetite from the the equity movement that we've had over the last 12 hours or so but let's get stuck into some of the headlines and Jerome Powell you know one of the reasons why we had a bit of a twofold event here was that yeah initially um, not a lot of commitment that came from the statement but then when the Q&A got underway obviously one of the first questions that the journalists were asking is that look Jerome you've deployed a lot of tools so far what else have you got you know, under the bonnet in, in case we have a, a large significant second wave of infections and the economy deteriorates even further than you foresee. And he basically said that it's looking likely that they're going to need to do more at some point in the future. And for anyone who's new to markets, that's pretty much what we'd call the code words, uh, the nuances of central bank speak. You know, central bankers never pre-commit. 
they will never specifically identify a date, future, and time of which they're going to take a certain course of action. Because if they do that, inevitably, there's so much uncertainty between point A and point B that they could end up then reversing that decision. And therefore, um, the market will lose confidence in that they're going to follow through on their commitments. And one of the greatest tools that a central bank has, which is its verbal communication, which is a tool, just like interest rates and QE in a sense of how it manages market expectations, is going to be diminished. So here, that, that kind of wording for me is prepping up then come another month or so, i.e. the June meeting, uh, I think then you're going to start to see potentially a little bit more evidence, of course, about the severity of the, uh, the impact that the, uh, the lockdown of this month in particular has had. Uh, and so they'll be in a better position as well to, to look at the virus and uh, the loosening measures that have taken place and how the global economy is faring and they can um, take a decision at that point in time. So that, that was Jerome Powell. The other thing, of course, was uh, Gilead Sciences. Um, some commentary yesterday, of course, just firing up expectations again that potentially, uh, remember, this isn't a, a vaccine as such. This is more a therapy using the remdesivir um, treatment that, what was suggested yesterday from some of the um, primary endpoints of the trials is that the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, otherwise known as the NIH, they said that remdesivir results indicate patients who received the therapy had a 31% chance of a faster recovery than those with the placebo. And so this is what they're trying to do. They're trying to find an existing therapy. Um, remdesivir was actually used in... Uh, SARS and Ebola so it definitely has a, a pretty decent track record uh, of results but obviously in a, in, a, in a different situation in terms of an actual virus but again these results are very positive and markets liking that because then you know is that going to help accelerate this reopening of the economy um, not that it's going to bring forward perhaps the vaccine coming but it helps ease then that potential earlier identification of these trends means that they, the governments can respond quicker, the thinking being, and so therefore have better control on this kind of contain and delay kind of strategy of allowing further outbreaks in future. So definitely positive. Uh, the CEO of the firm came out and basically said they've got more than 50,000 courses of the, co the company's experimental therapy packed in vials and ready to ship. Um, and as soon as the drug is authorized for emergency use by US regulators. Now on that front, uh, obviously, you know, going through medical sciences, that these drugs coming to market go through a arduous process and very lengthy in order to get um, tested through various onerous measures to ensure that they're safe and so on. But in this case, um, the federal uh, or formal approval would likely take months and require far more robust results than what the company has revealed so far. But during the outbreak, the FDA um, have shown willingness to clear medical products for emergency use with far less data than usual, because obviously needs must. If there's a pandemic and real human casualties at this point, then obviously they're going to do everything they can to fast track it uh, in that respect. So definitely worth keeping an eye on. Uh, we have kind of been here before a little bit with Gilead Sciences. Obviously, we had a bump up in markets and then their shares shot back down again um, after the, the kind of overall results in themselves were quite partial. This seems to be a little bit further development now upon that, that narrative. So again, quite positive, but I guess something to just keep an eye on going forward. Um, the other things then that we've had going in chronological order, uh, a couple of earnings reports of, of a large market cap nature last night, which have definitely helped uh, in the, the overnight session. Microsoft, uh, their shares were up 2% in aftermarket trade. Uh, quarterly sales and profit was up, uh, lifted by demand for internet-based software and cloud services. You know, if you think about it here, as the headline would suggest, everyone's having to work remotely from home uh, and of course then this meaning that you know the usage of particular internet based software so thinking about the office and that obviously is quite a subscription model that the the, the company has, has shifted to over recent years and that's proving very successful you know microsoft teams these types of applications as well are, are very widely used uh, and so they're they're benefiting on the back of that so their revenue gained 15 percent topped analyst estimates uh, and obviously the getting the boost from homebound consumers at the moment. 
The other company as well was Facebook. Their shares were even better aftermarket than Microsoft. They were up 10% in aftermarket trade. And we are talking about one of the largest companies in the world here. Uh, they reported an 18% increase in first quarter revenues, um, showing advertising demand was strong before the actual COVID-19 pandemic hit. Um, daily users of the company's app climbed 2.36 billion in March and one of the interesting things here, they said that um, there was an impact from the lockdown that commenced in the middle of March in America, but then more globally. However, one of the comments that a lot of the analysts were jumping on and what they're saying underpinned the strong rise in their shares was the fact that after the initial steep decrease in advertising as marketing budgets were generally tightened given the situation at the end of March, they have seen signs of stability already in April. And so again, this nature of um, investors, market participants being forward looking, they, they kind of jumped all over that and that's what caused the, the share price to rally so aggressively. Looking further forward to today, you know, it's, uh, it is busy in terms of corporate earnings. So just to give you a bit of a flavor of some of the bigger market cap names to look out for, again, in chronological order, uh, McDonald's reports at midday. Um, you've then got the likes of Altria, Comcast, ConocoPhillips, all reporting at midday London time, this is. Um, and then aftermarket, that's when we get the, the big boys, Amazon and Apple are the two that people will be looking at most closely uh, and we'll see whether or not they can follow suit. If you think about it, really nice response in, in Alphabet shares that we had uh, on the back of their earnings, now Microsoft, now Facebook, so these really big tech names which obviously helps them that disconnect, if you like, between what had been this kind of uh, the 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 reality of the health of these companies' intrinsic value on their balance sheet comparative to what we've been seeing in the, the overall kind of valuation of the stock market, which has been surging higher, even though the economic reality, reality is very dire. What we're getting here a little bit is, you know, quite depressed expectations for earnings. So a lot of these larger caps superseding those. Things like Microsoft, though, and Amazon, if you think about it, in terms of from the consumer, particularly being homebound, whether working or for just generally living their lives, demands on, say, those two company services, actually, probably even more so uh, than normal because of this unusual situation. And the fact that they're so large, these companies, we're talking $1.2, $1.3 trillion worth in market cap. They're such a large proportion of their respective indices like the S&P 500, if they perform well, they're going to drag up the rest of the index with them. So, yeah, these have been been quite important to help continue this this rally that we've been seeing over the last couple of sessions. For any of the guys on the distribution list, uh, I've sent this out to you, uh, so you'll have that in your inbox for the Amplify guys. Um, the other thing we've had overnight is some Chinese data. You've had the um, manufacturing PMI. Um, as you can see here, we had this quite severe dip on the back of the readings that would have been when China mainland was in full lockdown. We already had in the prior month a quite um, decent bounce back. And generally speaking, the manufacturing PMI, non-manufacturing PMI uh, have held up. Um, however, this purple line is the one I just wanted to, to show you really, which has remained in very deep um, contraction and that is new export orders so basically what this chart would suggest with these four lines there's one that's quite disconnected and much more negative and that would suggest then that basically domestically perhaps things stabilizing a little bit um, I'm not sure if you've seen there's been quite a lot of uh, graphics going around about the general kind of traffic congestion rates uh, this was something we were tracking as alternate data uh, back when we were trying to see the impact in China, uh, just given really the lack of visibility or transparency with their data, it was quite a good way, electricity use, uh, general traffic, to get an idea of activity within those regions. And, and that's really shot up. So definitely they're slowly returning back to a degree of normality. And domestically, perhaps things okay for the moment or somewhat stabilizing. But the problem is, is that you know they are still quite a heavy obviously orientation towards exporting goods and at the moment if the rest of the world is going through this severe 
economic situation, then that's going to have implications on the speed of which that they can recover. Uh, and we're seeing that with the new export orders still remaining heavy in contraction. Uh, oil prices uh, were up another dollar and a half this morning, uh, trading at 16.62. Uh, yeah, I was listening to Sam yesterday talking to some of the uh, the new guys, and I think he made a pretty good point. It was he was saying, you know, if you if you listen to FinTwit, um, which is you know people on Twitter who talk about things related to markets, you know, a lot of pain out there because a lot of people were kind of so sure that prices were going to go down, and they, they've been proved badly wrong because you know after getting down to 10 bucks we're we're now you know we're up seven dollars above that we've almost doubled the price over the course of the last day or so so a couple of the things that people are looking at here is obviously we had the weekly infantry data yesterday some people saying that you know that's it showed a build but the build was smaller than expected slight decrease in what we had seen in in, in previous weeks a lot of people as well looking at the fact that you know the, the kind of we've been monitoring the operational rigs in the US have been declining, so naturally the production rates are also um, moving lower, and we're seeing similar in other countries like um, Norway, the OPEC uh, kind of Gulf nations as well. So you know as we go into May, as we were anticipating, these kind of pledges to um, move production lower in combination with generally um, the response of which. Or, uh, energy corporations will have to make with such a low price point um, inevitably we're going to start to see a little bit of a rebalancing and as we're seeing with China you know with these traffic levels across the nation picking up again the economy and the PMIs not getting too ahead of ourselves, but somewhat stabilizing you know demand and supply are coming slightly more back into the realm of, uh, of equilibrium albeit still a little bit way to go just yet uh, but that's what's um, helping underpin uh, the oil price and its continued recovery from, from very depressed levels at the moment. On the coronavirus side, a um, couple of different things. not going to spend too much time on this. Um, basically, UK sizes up lockdown options and underscores second wave risk. Um, Dominic Rabb. You know, I, I, from a political point of view, and you know, don't 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 take this as a as what I think from the market, because this is totally disassociated. But I do think that Boris Johnson's going down quite a Donald Trump route, in a sense that for me, Donald Trump, if you remember, he named Mike Pence the vice president as the coronavirus czar, and for me, perfect strategy from Trump. That means then that not only now has he issued state governors the responsibility of the reopening plans and the implementation of that, the overall coronavirus dealings uh, are Mike Pence's problem, not his. So as much as we know that a lot of the pressure comes from the top, at the end of the day, other people will take the fall if it goes wrong. And I think Dominic Cummings, obviously the, the real brains behind the operation at number 10, he'll know this, and I think he's adopting a similar strategy. I'm, unfortunately for Mr. Mr. Rab, uh, I think he's going to be thrown under the bus when potentially then if this goes wrong. And that, that then just sees Boris through, uh, and now obviously Boris uh, having another child, um, I think it was yesterday, that obviously gives another reason as well to kind of step back, give Rab more of the, the rope uh, for keeping Boris out of the, the kind of firing line. Um, but we'll see. The, the point is here, from a more markets-sensitive perspective, Britain will next formally review its lockdown strategy uh, basically this time next week, the, the 7th of May. Uh, and that's where we're going to be looking for more details. Really fantastic article on the FT today, and I'm going to tweak some graphics, so my handle's here. Keep an eye on that. Um, but Italy... Uh, Spain, Germany, they've all outlined specific dates and specific measures that they want to, to do in order for this phased reopening of their economy. Britain hasn't done that yet, uh, which makes sense. Britain was slower locking down, they're slower coming out, and given the rate of infection still relatively high in some senses, um, then we're going to have to wait till May 7th. But it's quite good to see then how this is going to work uh, in practical, practical terms. Um, the UK's Deputy Chief Medical Officer, uh, Van Tam, suggested the virus could persist for some time, potentially until a vaccine is available. So the idea, of course, as we know now, is that this kind of ability to conduct then face-to-face -face is going to have to be limited. There's going to be uh, social distancing probably for several more months ongoing. It's going to be a very graduated um, 
period over the next probably 10 to 12 months until that vaccine becomes more widely available. Um, the other countries, of course, Germany, uh, they're actually new coronavirus cases increased the most in four days uh, yesterday. Uh, Merkel is due to consult with state premiers today on whether to lift more of the curbs imposed to stop the disease spreading. Uh, so those conversations, you might get some comments out of Merkel later on today. Uh, and then from Trump, uh, as we were just discussing really, um, if it's not Mike Pence's fault, if it's not the state governor's fault, well of course it's China's fault, it's the Chinese virus. Uh, the, and he said yesterday the Chinese are determined to stop him winning uh, another term. Um, he said that the trade deal has been upset by the pandemic. However, uh, other trade advisors within the administration yesterday said they're still committed to getting the, the previous agreement done in phase one of the trade deal. So again, a lot of political posturing going on. You know, I know it's hard to remember, but we do have a uh, presidential election happening in, in only a few months time. So he's got He's got a marketing campaign machine to roll out at this point. So nothing particularly new there, all fitting within the narrative. And again, you know, Trump is a master of this. I was showing this to some of the, the guys yesterday. And I think it's such a good graphic to, to really summarize the tactical approach from Donald Trump, uh, whether it be preemptive framing. And, and what we're seeing a lot of at the moment is diversion and deflection. You know, if you remember when he was being... Um, or attempted to be impeached at the time, that was when his his frequency of tweets was unbelievable. I think he did over a thousand in one month. Uh, and this is this is all completely going down this route. And I think that's why at least all things remain equal at this point, despite America and the globe gonna go through some of the, the most difficult hardship in its history. Uh, I still believe he's going to survive this uh, at this point in time and he'll, he will beat Joe Biden. But we shall see. There's obviously many more months to go. The final thing I want to talk about here is the ECB. I'm um, going to cover this live obviously later. Uh, but the ECB is to judge then if a trillion euro stimulus is enough. So here's a, here's a great crib sheet. And I'm going to tweet this as well uh, when I finish the briefing. Um, I always think that... Um, what the guys at ING do with preparing these kind of infographics which act as a bit of a matrix then to really break down what is a fairly complex event into a much more actionable parts. Uh, what I mean by this is basically they have um, the current stance which is in, in orange and they focus on the four key areas of policy of which market traders are gonna be looking at. So inflation outlook and growth outlook the interest rate and QE decisions, and this Pandemic Emergency Purchase Program, the PEPP. Uh, and it's on those four points then that we can determine how basically hawkish or dovish the ECB are being. And therefore, if you're trading things like the Euro dollar pair, for example, this is what I'd be looking at. Um, the thing I always say to people is that monetary policy, uh, particularly now, it's so incredibly complicated. I mean, if you think about the Federal Reserve, you know, we talk about the PEPP. I mean, there's about 15 others of those, of which I can't even remember half of them, that are in play at, all, at this point in time. And that, that does increase the complexity in trying to understand the language when the central banks are talking. My advice, though, to any trader, even if you're an, an experienced trader as well as a new trader, is try to cut through all of that, specifically pick out the single things that you're looking for, so that when you hear all the noise on the squawk or you see all the headlines or you listen to a press conference, you know, your ability then is you already know what, what's gonna cause potentially the word, the phrase, the sentence that's gonna move markets so that you can just eliminate and be very reactive in, in, a, in a prepared sense to be able to take action if necessary. So here, the reason why I like this is because you have this kind of you know, more dovish scenario going down, more hawkish scenario. So here RNG putting out some kind of euro dollar targets depending on the outcome or the mix, if you like, that we get over these four different um, key areas of policy. The baseline, I agree with them. Um, recent data suggests CPI pickup will take longer. Yes, recent data suggests significant slowdown activity. Yes, we know that's likely to be the case. 
on interest rates and QE, no change forward guidance for lower rates for longer. Uh, I agree, and the key thing here is that PEPP program hints at an increase and scope in the June meeting. So as we were saying about Jerome Powell and the Fed, I expect pretty much the same thing from um, Christine Lagarde. The thing that I'm, I'm looking for here really uh, in summary is this idea that Christine Lagarde needs to come out and basically reiterate her pledge that she will do whatever is necessary to get the job done. Um, I think by taking the actions that they've done so far, as with other central banks, there has been um, quite a lot of confidence in markets restored by the scope of actions and the timeliness of what they've done. But more, as Powell said yesterday, is probably going to be needed. And so we're looking for hints of that. The more she hints, if she was explicit, and let's say Goldman Sachs, for example, they think that the ECB will go for a 500 top up to QE this meeting. They are in the minority here, but that is a possibility. Um, if they just go ahead and they they take an immediate move then to increase the QE program, obviously that's gonna have a, a meaningful impact on prices. So yeah, let, let's see how it plays out. I'll, I'll be covering that uh, as, and when it has, as and when it is happening. Um, calendar wise for today, just to wrap up, um, through the morning, a couple of different things. Uh, obviously, we've had the GDP numbers out of France already this morning. Um, yeah, not pleasant reading. Um, GDP was down 5.8% uh, in Q1. Uh, and expectations were, I think, for minus 3.5%. So worse than expected. This comes, of course, after the GDP contraction in America uh, of 4.8%. That's the worst decline since the financial crisis in 2008. How much has this impacted markets? Very little, of course, because a lot of this is already priced in. And remember, we're talking Q1. Um, people are more kind of obsessed at the moment on making those forward-looking decisions on Q2. All right, that is it from me for the moment. Uh, I can hear my my little one screaming in the background, so I'm not going to talk any longer. Um, quickly, then, you've got the flash Eurozone CPI and GDP uh, at 10 o'clock this morning, so do keep an eye on that. It's probably one thing for any euro related assets that could create a little bit of short term movement but be mindful any trades on the back of that would likely be short lived people want to clear the deck ahead of the ECB and, you know always despite probably the lack of um, tangible outcome for many policy changes no one really wants to carry and hold risk into that event there is a possibility that they go as far as announcing as soon as today a top up to that, that, that purchase program. In the afternoon, you've got uh, from the US then, uh, personal income, core PCE price index, the weekly jobless claims, of course, probably lesser impactful now than they have been in the past. People are very much aware now of that situation of the uh, unemployment and what it's gonna look like for the America going forward. And you've got Chicago PMI, Canadian GDP as well coming out later. And that's it, that's a wrap. So. Uh, any questions, let me know. Otherwise, I'm going to let you guys get on uh, and I wish you a good day ahead. All right. Thanks very much, guys.